Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be taking another look at the ideas you guys have placed in the comments of our videos. With every video on our channel, more and more amazing suggestions are placed by you guys in the comment section and many of them will feature near-complete profiles for speculative biology creatures, which we will now feature on this special video. As last time, we will be drawing the creature suggested by the comments and giving some details on its biology and evolution, as well as explaining if, how and why our version deviated from that of the original comment. So let's go and see what your ideas would be like as real living animals. Also, if you're enjoying this channel's videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing, donating on Ko-fi, or joining our Patreon. Links available in the video's description. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Our first research subject of the day is one that has been transformed into almost mythical figures thanks to their terrifying appearance and demeanor. Wraiths, or Nixissimia morthofaciens, belong to the largest family of primates native to Europe, the Celtae, present specifically in the United Kingdom. Wraiths in particular are among the biggest members of the family, and some of the smartest, to boot often being seen using simple tools in their natural habitat, and aping, pun fully intended, many human behaviors when in proximity to their populations. In order to survive the cold winters of their habitat, wraiths have developed a dense layer of long, thick fur which covers them like a cloak, actually resembling one from far away. The hands and faces of these primates, however, will be completely devoid of fur, and colored as dark white to contrast with their dark cloak. This helps the faces and hands of wraiths to stand out from the rest of their body, a very useful thing since these are the main ways these apes communicate with one another. The dark spots on their faces help accentuate their facial expressions further with the added effect of making them resemble shrouded skeletons from far away. Wraiths will search for their food, fresh and not so fresh corpses, thanks to their keen sense of smell, which allows them to find food from miles away. Once they have tracked the smell of their meal, they will move incredibly fast, reaching prey as far as 20 kilometers or 12 miles in well under an hour. A lone wraith can strip a carcass to bones in a day, but a whole group will do it in a matter of minutes. Wraiths will often steal from human settlements out of curiosity, in a manner very similar to the American Grinch. While sometimes they will steal food, many times they will also take away clothes and tools, especially gardening and farming equipment that has been left unattended. If a raid learns how to use these items, it will teach the rest of its troop, as they will all benefit from clothes that help protect them from the cold, or sharp tools that make dissecting their food easier. If raids were already terrifying as they are, the sight of a raid wearing a long cloak and wielding a sight is enough to kill anyone from fright on the spot. Over time, the species has managed to spread across the world by sneaking into ships, causing panic in whatever countries they arrive in. Our first creature of the day are the wraiths, suggested by commenter Jack Swan, who has placed quite a few comments with amazingly detailed descriptions for humanoid creatures, including many belonging to the fair folk. Wraiths are ghost-like apparitions, and the version described by Jack is so eerie and grounded, while still fully resembling their folkloric counterpart, 
that I knew I had to include it in the video. One thing I did adapt from the original comment was the part about raids having bold faces and hands due to being scavengers, as more recent research suggests boldness in certain scavengers is more related to thermoregulation than hygiene. Instead, I made the hairlessness related to communication, which is more in line with primate biology. However, I did try to keep as much as possible of Jack's amazing idea, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Thanks a lot for the idea, Jack. Now, on to our next creature. Fascinating as it may be, scientists and zoologists may be forgiven for not wanting to approach Antrongulata satyria, the satyr, even for the sake of researching it. Evolved from similar stock as the alpine Krampus, the satyrs faced a similar evolution into bipedal herbivores that has transformed their front hooves into hand-like appendages, in order to better reach and manipulate food. However, this convergent evolution has not led to identical organisms, as both have adapted to their own particular environment. While the Krampus has evolved dense, shaggy fur to better withstand the cold, satyrs have evolved to resist the heat, developing a series of flattened structures that help cool their blood, including two large, fan-like ears and a fleshy facial protrusion above their nose. Their fur is also very sparse across certain parts of their body. Given their forest habitat, protection from direct sunlight is not as pressing an issue as it is in other types of goat, and this thinner fur helps them dissipate heat more easily. Despite their resemblance to the Krampus, satyrs are often much more aggressive than their mountain-dwelling cousins. While the horns of satyrs have been greatly reduced, as their usefulness for fighting in their new bipedal stance is much more limited, they can still be quite unpleasant. Whenever mating season arrives, satyrs will begin patrolling their territory, violently fighting their rivals by biting and kicking and displaying their organs to nearby females, or fighting and harassing anything that, to them, passingly resembles a rival or a female respectively. While very bothersome, this undiscerning behavior ensures no males trespass on their territory and no chance to impress a female is ever lost. This creature was suggested by Gethin Jones, a really cool satyr that evolved in a very similar vein to the Krampus from our holiday-themed episodes from last year. While an amazing idea, the similarity to that creature, plus the effort made by the commenter in detailing the speculative biology of this satyr, are what made me give this concept a spot on one of these episodes instead of giving it its own. While some of the similarity can be explained by the Krampus and the satyr evolving convergently, due to similar pressures and circumstances, the satyr is also very distinctly adapted to a different, much hotter environment, making it unique enough to be differentiated from the Krampus. Thanks a lot for the idea, Gethin. Now, let's get to our final creature of the day. While the tragedy of humans infected by lycanthropy is undeniable, there are creatures out there in the world that, in the eyes of many, have earned the same name. It is likely, in fact, that the worst fears of people regarding werewolves were in fact inspired by Papialupus cinerenius, the wolf baboons, similar looking creatures that, however, are as different in behavior as night is today. As baboons are already capable of eating meat, it was not such a strong leap for them to evolve into more specialized hunters. As they developed into full-time predators, 
their bodies became bigger and stronger, allowing them to hunt bigger and more varied prey, including bigger mammalian herbivores across northern Africa. As they did, their jaws became stronger in order to help them hold on to their prey's neck, strangling it in a manner similar to big cats, supported by their longer and more muscular limbs, the anterior ones helping it catch their prey and hold it as they deliver their deadly bite, while their posterior limbs evolved for speed and strength rather than climbing. The ears of these baboons have also become longer and cup-shaped, allowing them to more easily track their prey in the dark of the night. These terrifying predators evolved long ago, when humanity was still in its infancy, and started following the migrations of hominids as they did, giving shape to the first primal nightmares of our kind. While humanity was a force to be reckoned with, lonely, scared individuals in the dead of the night were a very different matter easily picked off before anyone had noticed the wolf baboons roamed near. As they moved north, these animals developed a denser fur coat that allowed them to resist this new, colder climate, and a change in coloration allowed them to blend into the forests they now inhabited. This second take on the werewolves was suggested by Mr. Reino Tanks and Jack Belinsky, among many great ideas for werewolves that were placed in the comments. It is clear there are lots of ways to imagine werewolves stalking our world, and this one is much more focused on the terrifying predator aspect than on the cursed human one, both great sides of the creature to work with. Other ideas for werewolves have been placed in the comments as well, and I do intend to keep going with more takes on these creatures. Regarding this one, I took the concept for a werewolf-looking baboon almost unchanged. Something easy given the anatomy of these primates is already eerily similar to that of a werewolf, including their long, canine-looking jaws. It was a very fun concept to work on, so thanks a lot for the ideas, Jack and Mr. Reino. And that's it for a speculative biology look into another tree of the ideas you guys have placed in the comments. Just as last time, it was incredibly fun to work with your more defined ideas for creature concepts, including two that came naturally from creatures we've seen on the channel before on their own episodes. I had a lot of fun doing this episode, and I'm very happy to be honoring some of your ideas in such a special episode as this one. Working on the videos for this channel has been a ton of fun, and I'm very grateful for all of you guys watching, giving great ideas and helping the channel grow. Remember, all of your ideas are greatly valued, and are bound to end on the channel in one way or another. So if you have any full-blown speculative biology concepts for mythical and fictional creatures, or just any ideas for creatures you'd like to see me draw and talk about on the channel, as always, mention them in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.